I'd like to hand it over to Rob so we can get started and, and learn more about the, the bridge. So thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you, Margaret, very much. And thanks everybody for showing up tonight. I appreciate your coming here to join us and hear about the new Mill Pond Bridge, which we're excited to show off the spring finally, as it has been recently rebuilt. I will start the slideshow. So uh, a recently reconstructed grist mill uh, and mill pond bridge has been built across the Pocanico River at Phillipsburg Manor. Again, as a connection between the visitor center and the historic site in the last couple of years, um, actually maybe a little bit more than that, we've been taking a longer route around the mill pond uh, coming out toward the barn area of the site, but now visitors will be able to directly walk across the mill pond to the grist mill and the manor house from the visitor center, more direct connection here at Phillipsburg Manor. The bridge and grist mill have been a popular visual representation of the Phillipsburg Manor site since the early 1800s. The bridge crosses the Pocanica River, so named by the Lenape Native Americans of the Wequashtik tribe, the first inhabitants of this area. The Pocanico name is said to me stream between two hills. Enslaved Africans of Phillipsburg Manor constructed a mill and dam for Frederick Phillips and Margaret Hardenbrook in the 1680s. It is not known if there was a bridge of any substance above the original dam or when the first bridge may have been built. This image by British born adventurer, mountaineer and author Charles Joseph Latrobe is the oldest known visual record of the mill and bridge. At the time of this image being created, the property was owned by Gerard and Cornelia Beekman. In the early 1830s, Latrobe visited the United States twice and traveled from New Orleans to Mexico with Washington Irving. I quote from his writings, as last year, we had trailed Rip Van Winkle into the recesses of the Catskill Mountains. We now trace Ichabod Crane through all his temptations and perils. We reconnoitered the little old Dutch farmhouse inhabited by the Van Tassels and the Van Brommels of the classic neighborhood to the east of the Tappan Zee. We sauntered along the Pellucid stream, filtering through Sawmill Valley, sheltered from the busy world behind the heights of the Hudson. We dozed away a sultry hour in the shades of Sleepy Hollow. Little more than a decade after its publication, the legend of Sleepy Hollow is already attracting overseas visitors to our neighborhood. Another early view shows the mill pond inclusive of the bridge, mill and manor house and the old Dutch church. This is an unusual view and one that is rather hard to replicate today because of the reconfiguring of the landscape around the mill pond and the parking lot and the trees that have grown up in the area. A detailed view of the image shows a bridge with railings and it also shows two people who appear to be African Americans. Were they formerly enslaved individuals who labored at the upper mill site? The institution of slavery was abolished in New York only a few years before this painting was made. I wish the artist had spent a few minutes just to learn the identities of these people and hear some of their stories. That would fill an enormous hole in our knowledge of Phillipsburg Manor's history from the early to mid 19th century when the property was owned for many years by the Beekman family who worked at the mill, who operated the farm site? What were their stories? This view from about 1850 is a closer view of the previous image and emphasizes the bridge, mill, and manor house. The rather rickety looking bridge appears to be more suited for people and pedestrians and not for carts or livestock to travel across. Indeed, two decades later, this painting shows a very active site with a farmer delivering grain to the mill and people on the bridge. It is likely that farmers entered the property near the present day intersection of Broadway and Bellwood Avenue and traveled around the mill pond by the manor house side rather than crossing the bridge from where the visitor center is now to the mill directly. The earliest image that I'm aware of that was published in a book was this image of Benson Lossing's journey along the Hudson River. In the post-Civil War period, Phillipsburg Manor was becoming a site of some historical renown, one approaching 200 years of occupation by non-Indigenous persons by this point. 
A sturdy railing here appears above the mill pond dam, but it's unclear what kind of surface might be behind it. This painting is a recreation of a popular Currier and Ives image originally dating to around 1870. This interpretation is a dramatic rendition in the historic Hudson Valley collection. And it does show a person standing on a sturdy walkway a safe distance above the upper mill pond. By the 1930s, Phillipsburg Manor was in danger of becoming a relic to be lost to the history books. Instead, the property was rescued from certain demise by John D. Rockefeller Jr. This would just be the first time that Phillipsburg Manor would be saved by a concerned person or persons of the Sleepy Hollow and Tarrytown and beyond community. In the 1940s, Phillipsburg Manor was an official tourist site initially called Phillips Castle Restoration before becoming part of the newly founded Sleepy Hollow Restorations in 1951. Commercially printed postcards of the time show a newly built bridge supported by stone piers, very different from the construction of the bridge that is out on the site today. Here we begin to see a regular rendition of the view of the bridge from the visitor center side, where visitors meet their guide and begin their journey to the explore our past. Our museum educator today are attired in reproduction clothing more appropriate to 18th century New York than an idealized representation of a strictly Dutch past as depicted here. In the late 1950s, it was decided the, the initial half done restoration of the Phillipsburg Manor site did not paint an accurate portrait of any one era of the site and that Phillipsburg Manor would be closed for about a decade. The mill pond would be excavated and the reproduction grist mill would be torn down and excavated and the manor house would be restored to its 18th century appearance. This photograph from just before that project began shows the restored 19th century mill with a covered water wheel and a staircase from a bridge uh, at the uh, mill and manor house side leading down to a grassy area behind the water wheel. Today, there is no staircase there and there is no grassy area below the water wheel and the mill at the mill directly about the Pocanica River. So there would just be a water area down there today and there's no bridge heading down or no staircase heading down to that part of the mill. Restoration was underway by 1964 and as part of the excavation and reconstruction, the Phillips Castle era Chris mill and bridge uh, was removed. The mill would be eventually rebuilt based on the archeological archeological findings of the original grist mill and a new bridge would be constructed across the Pocanico River. This excavation work led to the exciting archeological finds dating to the 17th and 18th centuries, including some of the earliest complete restored pieces of Chinese export uh, porcelain found in New York. And this white bowl with a blue dragon is one of my favorite items on the tour of Phillipsburg Manor, which you can come and see this spring. The manor house was restored to its original appearance and a new modern dam was disguised with a wooden bridge that approximated, perhaps more substantially, the earliest appearance of the bridge from those 19th century paintings. The next thing I'm gonna show is a, a short video clip from a promotional uh, item put together after the mill and manor house reopened in 1969. The reconstruction of the dam, bridge, mill, and manor house was complete and the site reopened to visitors following that 10 year or so period when it was closed. And these new publicity materials produced around this time uh, show, showed off the newly restored upper mill site with emphasis on the mill, the bridge, and that view of the manor house from the new visitor center site. So I'll play a short 30 second clip here, but afterwards, if you'd like to check out the full video, it is on the HHV uh, YouTube webpage. I'm gonna just stop sharing for a second because I to make sure that I had the sound playing here. Okay. With crude wooden dams, the pioneers harnessed the power nature offered. On a thousand wild rivers, they built their little mills. Wooden wheels turned. In some places, they are turning still.
The fellow shown in this video is Charles Howell. I believe he was a sixth generation miller who was hired to come over from Great Britain to work here at Phillipsburg Manor, newly rebuilt grist mill in 1969. And he was the miller here for about 20 years. He became something of a local celebrity here operating the grist mill. Uh, but clearly in the publicity materials, the star of all these new brochures and photos and videos with the bridge and the manor house, and again, the dam and the bridge crossing the Pocanico River. And uh, site admission tickets also emphasize that view, standardizing it, again, the view from the visitor center is really being like kind of the new classic look of Phillipsburg Manor. And that's one that would be used in countless you know, promotional items after 1969. Sleepy Hollow Restorations also sold Wedgwood plates made in England that featured this new classic view as well. And of course, a popular souvenir taken home by many visitors was a bag of cornmeal or wheat flour that showed a slightly different view of the mill and the manor house and the farm. And again, with a couple of people standing on the bridge there to the right. For a better representation, here's a folk art engraving it appeared originally on the flower bag. The way that the people are dressed seems perhaps more representative of, of a time and place other than Phillipsburg Manor in the middle of the 18th century. But nevertheless, this was a popular image that was used for some years on some of the earliest promotional items at the site. And then in the 1970s and 80s, we started to see a lot of uh, modernized postcards with full color photographs of that view from the visitor center area or the picnic area just to the right of the visitor center. The autumnal view was especially popular. On the image down the lower right, uh, probably taken in the mid 1980s, it would be hard to tell, uh, but that probably shows the reconstructed grist mill, which was built around 1984, 1985, closely replicating the appearance of the bridge. It was rebuilt in 1969. And again, just probably from years of of use and exposure to the weather, it decided to rebuild uh, the grist mill or the mill pond bridge at that time, but it was very identical to what was there in 1969. The postcards are also really interesting for some of the messages that were found on the back of them. And these were a couple of postcards that I found recently on eBay. And here's one from a person who came on a bus trip to Sunnyside, uh, also came here in the path, but came again with a different tour company. They also toured Lindhurst and had a great lunch at the Westchester Marriott and then stopped in at Van Cortland Manor overlooking the Croton and Hudson Rivers. And uh, it said, I hope to find a mailbox to drop this in, signed Elsie. And I'm just wondering if this was perhaps sent by the ghost of Elsie Janice, who is the last inhabitant of the Upper Mill site. She was an actress in the early 1900s and lived at the Manor House until about 1937. So I wonder if that is our Elsie who sent this postcard to a visitor from the past. Here we have another postcard, perhaps a bit more endearing and uh, written from a young gal named Susan who wrote, Dear Grandma and Grandpa, we saw this in a film. It's called A Dam and you can walk across it. It is very pretty, love Susan. So the Mill Pond Dam and Bridge really made a big impression on our young visitor here and thought it was something that was important that she should uh, make note of when writing a letter to her grandparents. Truly, uh, this bridge crosses the gap across time and generations and families. And it's also uh, an image that appears in my family photographs as well. This is my grandmother on the left, Edith Stein Downing, who was a docent for Sleepy Hollow Restorations in the late 1960s and early 1970s who worked not only at Phillipsburg Manor, but at Van Cortland Manor and at Sunnyside. And she's pictured here with my mom, Kathy, and my brother, Chris, and my sister, Katie. And I was about at least five years away from existing at this time, but I did make many visits to Phillipsburg Manor when I was a student in the local area uh, in Irvington and later on coming on my own as an interested visitor. So the bridge represents a physical connection from one side of the river to the other, from the modern side of the visitor center to the historic core representing a bridge across time and also a bridge across generations and a connection, connection among families who've had a personal interest in Phillipsburg Manor. Because the bridge is so narrow, it is not used as a demonstration or interpretation space, but it often is the backdrop for demonstrations and interpretation at the site. 
This photograph taken by former site director Tom Thacker shows students and apprentices from the Rocking the Boat, Rocking the Boat organization riding in a cargo scow that they had just built at Phillipsburg Manor. Rocking the Boat is a youth development organization based in the Bronx. And for a few years, they set up shop at Phillipsburg Manor and using period tools and in period dress, built reproduction historic vessels. This black and white photograph makes it look like we've stepped back in time. But I think that the poses of the boat builders, now sailors, suggest that they are firmly in the present, not stuck in the past, but learning from history to build their own futures. The bridge, mill, and manor house have also served as a source of inspiration for artists. This is a winter scene by David Sweet. It's one of the earliest artistic images of the post-1969 restoration. David Sweet was a Tarrytown and Sleepy Hollow artist who was known for his depictions of historic landmarks here in Westchester County and had worked as a freelance commercial artist in New York City. The water powered mill did not historically operate in the winter time as the Pocanica River would turn to ice so it wouldn't be possible to operate the water wheel. So this is a peacefully quiet scene in contrast with the hum of activity found throughout the rest of the year. One of my good friends and colleagues when I began working at Historic Hudson Valley over 20 years ago was farmer turned security guard, Andrew Allen. And he was a bit ahead of the curve when it came to digital art, at least compared to me. And Andrew had produced this vivid false color representation of the mill bridge and the Pocanica River. He also added an alpine landscape in the background today where one would see traffic, gas stations and houses. So the bridge view from the visitor center is an appealing view in any season. And I, for one, had never tired of taking photographs from that visitor center vantage point. And the light is always changing and always producing a slightly different image here, never getting the same shot exactly twice. And the Mill Pond Bridge has also become, become a haven of sorts of, for wildlife, a lookout for birds eyeing their next meal in the Mill Pond below. Our colleague, Mark Stefanoff, took this picture on one of his many kayak trips up the Pocanica River from the Hudson River to the Mill Dam and back. Historic Hudson Valley staff have observed and photographed the black crowned night heron, northern mockingbirds, red-tailed hawks, great blue herons and egrets perched on the bridge railings, eyeing fish and other meals in the water down below them. Here's a particularly awesome photograph that was taken by Joseph McGill last summer. And Joseph has uh, started a fantastic project called the Slave Dwelling Project, where he visits historic properties, uh, primarily up and down the East Coast, but now he's extending into the interior of America as well, visiting places where uh, enslaved Africans were held captive and forced to labor and often sleeping in slave cabins if they survived, uh, but oftentimes sleeping uh, in buildings where enslaved persons labored if the original slave cabins do not survive. So he visited Phillipsburg Manor last summer and uh, spent a night there and also a night at Van Cortland Manor. I had the uh, privilege of joining him at Phillipsburg and we spent the night uh, sleeping in one of the rooms of the manor house and in the morning, uh, he had gone across the Mill Pond Bridge to get our breakfast and I'd stayed behind to lock up the manor house. And as I saw him going ahead of me, I saw him with the egret and the heron perched on opposite railings. And that's a sight that you almost never see. Usually is you know, one bird or the other, but never both at the same time. And uh, Joseph had this incredible experience there being able to photograph both of them. I, I wanted to go over and join him, but if I knew I would startle the birds and they'd fly away. So I let him have that moment and he got the picture before uh, he crossed over and they moved on. Sadly, the forces of nature have had other less wonderful effects on the Mill Pond Bridge. Hurricane Floyd in 1999 was one of the first major storms that pounded the bridge and led to its eventual closing. So you know, we benefited from nature in terms of the wildlife to come and see us and visit, but the forces of nature have also done some detrimental work to the Mill Pond Bridge. The storm surge uh, was so intense during Hurricane Floyd that the earth on both sides of the bridge washed away entirely. Water flooded the grist mill and the manor house. And by far, this was the most significant damage to the site during its history as a museum. The New York Times came by and photographed the mountain of sandbags placed by community members who all pitched in to save Phillipsburg Manor that afternoon, stopping the 
waters from flowing into the mill and the manor house and taking their rightful course back over the bridge and dam if possible. Those who volunteered to help historic Hudson Valley included staff from all departments and neighborhood residents and even the girls soccer team from Hackley School. Truly, it took a community effort to save Phillipsburg Manor uh, that afternoon when, when uh, Hurricane Floyd had come through, uh, saving the site from near destruction. It was really bad. It, it could have been a lot of worse if it weren't for the fact that a lot of people came by in very short order and, and saved the site from uh, further damage from the floodwaters of Hurricane Floyd. With the onslaught of debris and, and silt backing up behind the dam, the mill pond was dredged in 2002. A large crane was brought in to hoist a dredging barge over the bridge into the mill pond. This was a rare sight, and I was able to take a photograph of it way back when. I've seen a lot of different and interesting things happen at Phillipsburg Manor, and this was certainly a very interesting sight, seeing this crane it was probably about 200 feet tall hoisting this barge uh, delicately between the mill and the manor house over the bridge and into the pond. At this time, a stone culvert was built around the visitor center end of the bridge, allowing excess water to flow through and not to damage the earth between the visitor center and the bridge. And it has been successful in every storm since. So we did a great job building that and it saved the uh, dam area from further destruction. Additional storms in the following decade also continued to batter the bridge. And we were beginning to find that these storms that used to be labeled once a decade or once a century even were becoming annual events. Here's an overflow uh, valve there underneath the uh, uh, stone walkway there and the earthen plaza uh, was successful once again as water went through that overflow valve around the dam and around the bridge and out to the lower mill pond below. Again, protecting the uh, earthen area there and the walkway and the visitor center from the floodwaters. Storms like this unnamed storm crested just below the high mark of Hurricane Floyd. So they didn't need to have a name or be even be part of a, a hurricane uh, to con conduct a lot of damage there to the bridge. Hurricane Irene was another memorable high water storm in 2011. Again, we're seeing this, this high water mark where basically the mill pond at the upper portion and the lower portion were indistinguishable. The water was just flowing across at a straight flat level, it was not going downward uh, from the upper pond to the lower pond, but just flowing straight out right above the dam there and just underneath the uh, decking of the actual bridge. These storms also threatened to overflow Route 9 as well and seen it in this image of the Broadway Bridge. These heavy storms took their toll and repair of the bridge piece by piece was no longer feasible and it was decided to close the bridge and seek funding for complete reconstruction. A little bit of glimmer of progress while the bridge was closed was the work undertaken at the grist mill, including reconstruction of the water wheel seen through the uprights here of the railing of the old bridge. And there was a new flume that was built to the right of that. The flume is that channel that carries water from the mill pond to the water wheel. So while the bridge was closed, uh, we were very busy with other projects on the site there, including uh, major reconstruction work at the grist mill. But to access the historic site while the mill pond bridge was closed, staff and visitors walked around the pond using another bridge adjacent to Broadway, and that would lead visitors out onto the site near the barn. With funding and permits all finally in place, the bridge was dismantled entirely and individuals and donors and foundations and public corporations all came together to ensure that this important project would move forward. The pond was empty to enable workers to access the bridge from dry land in order to carry out the work of dismantling the bridge and prepping the site for the construction of the new bridge. In 2019, work was undertaken to create temporary coffer dams to enable work on the lower mill pond where large support posts would later be installed. Sand from the coffer dam was later repurposed as fill in the Village of Sleepy Hollow sewer project on Cortland, uh, Continental Street. 
So finally, uh, the new bridge was beginning to take shape during the time that the uh, site had been closed the last couple of years. And the project uh, design uh, contractor, Stantec, subcontracted with local, comp local companies to do the on-site work. Abbott and Price from nearby Millwood did the work of dismantling, dismantling the old bridge and building the new bridge. Durable woods were chosen for their long lasting resilient properties against decay and heavy use. And to ensure compatibility with the historic nature of the site, the bridge project was approved by the New York State Office of Historic Preservation. So they signed off on the visual plans for the bridge and, and the materials that would be used and the construction methods. Again, just to ensure that uh, the appearance of the finished bridge uh, would not detract from the historic site, but would fit in just as the earlier versions of the bridge had done. As the bridge platform and railing took shape, the view again began to resemble the early drawings and paintings of the site. The spacings of the piers is wider on the new bridge so as to not obstruct debris coming over the dam. One of the problems as uh, seen in those earlier images of Hurricane Floyd and Irene was that uh, so many limbs of trees or entire trees or debris from people backyards uh, were coming down or being caught uh, between the uprights of the bridge, which were much closer together. But now that these uprights are a little bit wider and spaced further apart, any debris that might come down in, in another you know, monumental storm should simply flow right over the dam and not get stuck underneath the bridge. We were required to install a new safety feature, however, consisting of stainless steel cable wire strung vertically to prevent small children from falling through and over the dam. Ginger here approves of the work. She's our barn cat, and she was probably the first uh, HHV staff person to take a walk over the completed bridge when it was finally rebuilt. Underneath the bridge were installed uh, three conduits from the visitor center to the mill for communications. Another way that the bridge is literally a connecting link across the Pocanica River. And at the mill end of the bridge, new levers were installed to control the gates that open or close to allow the flow of water to the flume and the water wheel at the grist mill site. At the grist mill itself, Abbott and Price also con completed restorations of mill exterior and support piers. And Antonio Cabinetry of Sleepy Hollow, another local company up the street from Phillipsburg Manor, installed new window frames and wooden shutters. So we partnered with many local companies in the reconstruction of the bridge in the mill. With the bridge project complete, we are now turning our attention to the two final phases of the site restoration project, including landscape restoration and dredging of the mill pond. We are getting permits and raising money. And once again, the extremely generous support of our donors and our members and our public and private partners are coming together to support the ongoing restoration of Phillipsburg Manor. And at this point, I'm going to share a special interview with a local craftsman who worked on rebuilding the Phillipsburg Manor Bridge in 1985. In a five minute video, Eric Klingen of Tarrytown Woodwork will share his memories of working on the bridge in 1985. And he'll share his thoughts on why the bridge is important to the Sleepy Hollow community. And he is also a postcard collector of Phillipsburg Manor. And we will see some of the images that he has collected and shared with us. And we'll learn some of the history that he has uncovered in his own research. So again, it's a five minute video and it's a great one. So um, afterwards we'll reconvene for some Q&A. People tend to think of this as just sort of a, a quaint historical artifact, but it represents something, you know, a different world that, uh, you know, is part of our, should be part of our inheritance. Hi, my name's Eric Klingen. Uh, I have been running this uh, woodworking studio here since something like 85 and I've restored thousands of pieces of furniture uh, during my sojourn here and the only reason this has all happened is because the wood that was supposed to be delivered for the Phillipsburg Manor Bridge in the mid 80s did not arrive on time and instead of my mentor building the bridge with a crew of people at Phillipsburg Manor 
he scrambled around and found this garage off of Main Street in Terrytown to do the job because the wood didn't arrive until Thanksgiving. And the, we built the bridge in here in bays like a barn and then drove it over in a pickup truck and assembled it over the Pecanico River in the dead of winter. When that project was over, the question was, do we just walk away from this great workshop space that we created? It kind of changed my life. If I'd known that I'd be here uh, all these years later, I wonder what decision I would have made. But it's worked out in the sense that I've managed to continue you know, restoring things. But uh, instead of architectural work, this is, I'm predominantly working on furniture with the, the smattering of uh, sculptures and, you know, anything made out of wood that requires handwork and some, some artistic uh, intervention. Based on, you know, my modest amount of research into it, it seems that there's been multiple uh, versions of this, some rather astoundingly sturdy looking things that are long gone. Based on the really early depictions of it, which I have, I would say they just would put less effort into it. And they also didn't have tour groups dancing across it. So I think it would have been just a working bridge. So they did not put the effort into it to make it as uh, robust as I think we did. Now, if they did would they have taken carts of, you know, like a horse and cart across that? Uh, I somehow doubt it. I think they would have gone to the, around the end of the pond there. I, I don't see any version of that bridge that doesn't look like it's about to collapse until I, I have a postcard from 47 with a lady dressed up in a Dutch outfit on a very beautiful bridge. Well, there are not a lot of examples of that kind of work. It's a tactile as well as a visual experience to use something like that. It's nice that you actually use it if someone's visiting the site and approaching it from the bridge. It's sort of like you cross this bridge and then you're in another place. Even though it's an incredibly short, you know, a 200 foot long journey, it, it sets the stage for, you know, now we're plopping ourselves into a different time period. It's not just an anachronistic uh, throwback to a uh, harder time. It does represent a human relationship to the landscape and to the land that is worth continuing to experience. In our world, there just isn't a lot of that connection to the past. So it's, it's, it's great to have, especially in this town. It's special to me because it, 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 it literally is one of the components of the history of my life that if it hadn't been there, I can safely say that probably my life today would be completely unrecognizable from the one I'm in. Like it's really hard to imagine what would have happened if I hadn't built that bridge. When I look back on it, I think that building these things by hand and using the skill sets, it's, there's math, there's physical activity, there's the materials themselves, the, the tools, all that coming together is a, a very rewarding career. And uh, so uh, that's, what, uh, that's what that bridge you know, means to me personally. Great, well, thank you so much, Rob. That was really wonderful. Um, and I think it's, it's really nice to wrap up with a, a story of one of the people like Rob, who has been involved with Historic Hudson Valley for so long. And, you know, at this point has really become part of the history of Phillipsburg Manor. Um, and more than anything, I think Historic Hudson Valley is a, it's a community. It's a community of people who care about history and who care about um, this area and continuing its beauty and its importance. Um, but it's stories. And I think that's one of the fun things about having members join us as well. One of the things we've seen is that a lot of members went to Phillipsburg Manor for the first time 30 years ago. And they remember what it was like uh, visiting on a field trip as a child or um, you know, just dropping by or driving by it every day on the way to school. Um, 
So anyway, um, thank you to Rob and we'd love to hear any questions you have. Feel free to unmute yourself and just jump in and ask, or we'd also love to hear any of your stories from, from Phillipsburg Banner. And uh, maybe you remember when you, you, when you came by or um, you know, whatever questions you have, we, we'd love to hear them. So anybody? No stories from early visitors. Okay, um, so I wonder, Rob, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the cool things that were found when the mill pond was dredged before? Um, I know you showed us some objects, but I know from living in the area that, for example, I mean, I have neighbors who found an old gun in their backyard and I found an old clay pipe in, in my backyard. Um, so are there other kind of cool things that people might not know about that have been found on the site? So yeah, a lot of what was found there were fragmentary items and whether they were, you know, refuse from the enslaved community that lived at the site or whether they were refuse from the Phillipses and the rare times they came to the, visit the manor house. It could have been a little bit of both. It could have been goods that came off a ship that came up uh, from Manhattan to the upper mill site. So there was just a lot of imported trade goods is what it was, household items, whether it's, uh, again, like a, a Chinese export porcelain bowl or delftware from Europe. Um, you know, fragmentary pieces of things like that were being imported. So we do have a number of those items in our collection from the excavation, but also the foundations of the grist mill itself were uncovered. There were other structures that were um, uncovered in the dig. Uh, some of the things were uncovered were some of the millstones, and I believe some of them were actually repurposed in the foundations of the rebuilt mill from the 19th century. And today, those millstones were, you know, had been placed around the property from the 1969 restoration. They were taken out of the ground and placed around the site. So you can see or sit on or, or rest on some of the millstones around the property, which I think is pretty cool, you know, knowing that they were once used there in that mill to grind grain and had been buried for you know probably a couple hundred years and now put back out. I think that's pretty cool. And do we know where the millstones came from? I mean, were they quarried nearby and were there people who specialize, they're gigantic and obviously very heavy. So I'm a little bit wondering like, was that something they would have made on site from rock that was quarried locally or were there people who specialized in making millstones? So certainly when the first uh, mill was built in the 1680s, stones would have been imported at that time. There was really not a large stone quarrying industry set up in the Hudson Valley at that time period. So from the time that we interpret Phillipsburg Manor, 1680s to 1750s, when the Phillipses owned it, yeah, these were stones that were being imported from Europe. Uh, some came from Germany, some would have come from France, some would have probably have come from England. Uh, the French burr stone was very popular for grinding wheat. It was a type of quartz kind of rock. And uh, really later on in the Hudson Valley in the 19th century when there would have been more established stone quarries uh, for mills that were being built elsewhere in the Hudson Valley, again, 19th century and onward. Uh, but for our time, these were stones that were produced in Europe. But we also have an amazing amount of information on the historic Hudson Valley website. Um, there's a YouTube channel that has more great informational videos, um, lots more information on our program. So I definitely would encourage you to check those out. Um, they, they give you a lot of resources for learning and just enjoying the site. And then very soon you'll be able to come join us and enjoy it in person. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you all there. Um, I just want to give my thanks again to Rob. Uh, that was that was really great. It was it was a pleasure to, to learn more about the bridge and, and the history of Phillipsburg Manor. So Yep, keep an eye peeled for more programming to come. And yeah, we hope to see everyone soon. Thanks, everybody. Look forward to seeing Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good night.